welcome to Building Esports. Uh, my name is Nick Allen, I work at Twitch. Uh, I'm also joined by Chris from Daybreak, the executive producer on H1Z1. Uh, so we're gonna be talking overall for about an hour. Um, I'll be talking about 20 minutes or so, then I'll open it up to the, for you guys for questions. Um, but really the takeaway, at least from my presentation, is hopefully you walk out of here uh, was sort of a holy shit moment of, hey, there's a lot that goes into esports as a whole. And I think what you see for the most part in esports are these top level leagues on Twitch um, or on some other platform. But underneath these top level leagues uh, are a bunch of moving parts. And my hope is I can just highlight this again, just so you guys have an idea of like what goes into building esports. And today I'm gonna be doing that through the lens of Rocket League. Um, so Twitch, um, probably about a year ago now, entered into a partnership with Psyonix uh, to help build Rocket League esports. Uh, Rocket League was a title that came out of nowhere, surprised a lot of people, and has a lot of potential, uh, had a lot of potential. So I'll be talking a little bit about that um, and about our partnership, and again, all these moving parts. Um, and again, this is a picture. I used to work at Riot. I pulled this off Twitter. Someone put devil horns on me. I thought it would be a good icebreaker. So uh, one caveat really quick. Uh, Chris and I were talking about who wanted to go first, and I wanted to go first because my slides are really terrible, um, and I figured his slides are probably really good because I've, I've played Daybreak games. So, uh, so let's talk about the agenda really quick. So I have a friendly reminder for you guys, um, and then I'm gonna talk about identifying esports potential. Twitch um, has an esports department, and the esports department itself uh, focuses on building partnerships with game companies around esports, uh, ultimately to help them make better decisions around their titles in the esports space. And our department was born out of uh, a lot of different entities, a lot of different game companies coming to Twitch and asking like, how do I do this thing? How do I do it right? Uh, and seeing a bunch of other titles just not being successful in the space. Uh, we call that the esports graveyard, but essentially that is people coming in and throwing a bunch of money at probably the wrong things in esports, and you see these titles just dip and disappear and you never hear from them again. I won't call them out by name, but you probably have some in mind of like something that blew up and then instantly disappeared. Twitch, we want longevity and sustainability in the esports space, uh, quite selfishly, honestly, because we think that if esports are successful, they're gonna be on Twitch and more people are gonna watch it and that's good for us, but it's just good for the space in general and we just wanna grow the thing to be as big as we can. So I'll be talking about esports potential and how at Twitch we identify that. Um, I'll talk about the goal. We generally have one big goal as we think about esports at Twitch as when we think about these partnerships. And then we'll be talking about growing the ecosystem. And again, I want you guys to look at all the moving parts and think about sort of the complexity that comes in building a sustainable, successful esport. But first, a friendly reminder um, on the spelling of esports. So you don't capitalize the M in email. Uh, so why the hell would you capitalize the S in eSports? It looks weird when you put it at the front of a sentence and you have two capital letters in a row. Uh, it sort of undermines the brand a little bit. So please, uh, advocate for the correct spelling. Thank you very much. Um, if you walk away with one thing from this presentation, the friendly reminder of how to spell eSports correctly. Okay. Um, so talking about identifying potential. So we talk to a lot of different game companies uh, and they come to us and they like, hey, I wanna do eSports. Um, and they don't have a clear understanding of what that is or why it's cool or what it's about or anything. Uh, and so we come in and we assess the game and we try to give recommendations on what they should do, how they can improve, what should they should be thinking about. Um, and the amount that we sort of invest in, and sort of partner with them depends on do we think that the game has a lot of potential in the esports space? And so the way that we evaluate that um, is, does the game have a high skill ceiling? And does it have some features that allow for a competitive culture around the game? So private matchmaking, you'd be surprised, a lot of game companies come to us and like, hey, we wanna do an esports. It's like, well, you have no way for one person or one team to play against another team sort of like on demand. So that's the first thing you're gonna need in order to be able to create a competitive culture around your game. Um, and, and, and it goes for things like, so private matchmaking, custom game rules, can the community decide like what's competitive um, and what, uh, what's the highest level of competition around the game? 
And then the leaderboards are also a really important piece that we look at. Is there this aspirational path to being the best player in the world? Again, it goes back to this idea. Is there a competitive culture? Uh, Rocket League does these things extremely well. Um, there, is, there is a huge competitive community uh, that aspires to be the best in the world. Also identifying potential. So we look at, is there an existing and growing grassroots community? So these are examples of uh, grassroots competitions and organizations that existed before Cyonix and Twitch partnered for Rocket League. Things like Rocket Royale, Rocket League Central. This is Geek Core running the, this Rocket League tournament as well. And what these indicate is that people want to compete and people want to organize tournaments. Those are two brutally important pieces of a holistic esports ecosystem. We forget, we think much about uh, the production company, the developer and the game company, um, maybe the broadcasting platform, but you forget about the tournament organizers oftentimes uh, and the aspirational path to being a tournament organizer, content creators. Uh, there, there are a bunch of small players that are important in the growth of this holistic ecosystem. And this indicates that something is happening um, that there could be more. And so this is one of the big things that we look for when we think about identifying potential in an eSports title. And then lastly, and, and almost most importantly, is does the game company have an appetite to invest? And there's two ways that they can do this. One is cash money. Are they willing to put up prize money that is aspirational and interesting to players? Are they willing to support and create sustainability? Are they willing to take potentially some of their revenue that they're making on in-game items and pass that down to the players and the teams? Are they willing to do that? And oftentimes, we talk to game companies, uh, they don't realize how much money they need to invest to be able to get this thing off the ground and be sustainable long-term. Um, and oftentimes, we're like, hey, well, you should do this event, and you should do this other event, and you should do all these other things. Like, well, we have a marketing budget for one small event in this, in this one city, and that's all we can do the whole year. Um, that isn't a sustainable long-term plan. And so this is a really big part. And the second thing is, and it's very closely related, bandwidth, resource, engineering resources. Are you willing, as an entity, as a company, to invest in creating cool, compelling things in the game that support your esports efforts? Um, and this can also feed into this sort of revenue aspect too, but it's oftentimes um, companies aren't willing to change their roadmap to accommodate this esports ecosystem that is super important to the competitive culture around their game. And so one of the first things that we ask when we talk to a game company is, you know, how, how big are you willing to go? If this thing gets enormous, are you willing to support it? Um, and what are your engineering resources, your internal resources, uh, that you're willing to, to utilize to support the things that you're doing. Um, so again, very, very important things that we think about when we identify um, you know, potential opportunities in esports. So bringing this back to Rocket League and Psyonix, Psyonix is an amazing partner to Twitch around uh, the Rocket League Championship Series and around esports. And it was clear very early, though they were a small studio, they were willing to invest whatever they needed to do to help this thing be successful, to help it be sustainable. <laughs> And that showed us that we could do something with them long term. It would be interesting, uh, and we think it would be successful. And we're going to talk a little bit about all the different things that we've done. So that's identifying potential and what we've done. Um, and talking about the goal, um, going back to this idea of like the eSports graveyard, uh, people generally have a top-down approach. Game companies generally have a top-down approach when they think about eSports. Uh, I know Chris will have some things to say about this and some really good things, too. Um, Thinking about just let's create a top level event uh, for the best players in the world. We'll throw a bunch of money at it and then that's it. Um, and then you have an entire player base that wants more, that desires more around the game that you're forgetting about, that you aren't supporting. Um, so it's important to have a really holistic view of supporting the eSport. Uh, and so talking about Rocket League and the way that we've done that, um, so we have the top level league, which is the Rocket League Championship Series. We're on our season three right now, um, and we've had a lot of success. I could do an entire presentation on just a top level league, but to give you an idea of what goes into this, um, we have one person at Twitch fully dedicated to the scheduling uh, of, the, of the league and also the rules. That's all that this person does. He's a full-time job um, supporting our rule set, supporting our schedule, working with teams and players to resolve conflict. 
Um, and that is just one small aspect of a giant, massive league. So when you think about even a bigger league like the League of Legends Championship Series uh, that has a staff of like 120 people to support that initiative, um, you start to understand how big uh, these things can be and how many moving parts. We're talking about production, stage design, hospitality, um, all these different moving pieces and all the teams that you need to have to support these things. We're also investing heavily in caster development. These are the storytellers of the eSport. They are the faces of the game in many ways and of the eSport too. Um, so these are all the casters for, this is season one, the broadcast talent. All of these people were handpicked out of the community to come in and then were um, mentored and cultivated to be the professionals that you see today. Um, and many times, this is what people think about. These guys are the people that they think about when they think about Rocket League. And they need to be able to represent the league themselves, players, the brand, everything extremely well. Um, if you have an amazing league, but your casters are not talented or toxic or a bunch of different things, you can undermine the entire thing. So this is just one foundational piece that you have to develop. And we have at Twitch and at Psyonix, we have uh, people fully dedicated to growing the professionalism and talent of uh, the Rocket League Championship Series and of Rocket League. Path to Pro. Um, so this is a really, really important aspect that a lot of people don't think about. Um, when you think about football, professional football, and you think about what it takes to be a professional and how you get there, there is a clear path for you. You play in peewee football, and then you play in middle school, then high school, then college, and then you're a pro. Um, for many esports, you say, how do I get in this top level competition? People have no idea. There's no clear aspirational path for people to look at and say, um, how do I get there? I have no idea. And, and so they just they stop trying. Path to Pro is an extremely important point. And with the Rocket League Championship Series, we utilize an open qualifier every, every season to qualify in the next round of teams. Um, our first or second season had over 6,000 teams sign up for the Rocket League Championship qualifier. Um, if you think about there's three to four players on every team, so you're talking roughly about 20,000 Rocket League players that you have to manage over the course of one to two weeks. Um, and we have a full staff of Psyonix and, and Twitch employees, six, seven, eight people in a war room over the course of a weekend uh, running this tournament and all the moving parts with 20,000 players. Um, and as the, the amount of people, and the, as the prestige rises for the RLCS and more people start playing Rocket League, the more people are gonna be entering this thing, the more challenging it becomes. But with that in mind, it's an important piece. Again, that aspirational path of growing and becoming a professional is really, really important. Narrative development, the storylines are an interesting piece, uh, are an important piece uh, of esports and something often overlooked. Um, why do you care as a viewer? Uh, why do you care about these players and these teams? Um, esports doesn't have the regional alliances or the regional rivalries that we see in traditional sports. So you need something else, something to, to care about and be passionate about. Uh, and these types of stories help build that narrative, help build up the celebrity and fame uh, of these players and make it interesting for the fan to be like, hey, this is why I follow Kronovi, the best player in the world in Rocket League. Uh, and again, just very, very important stuff as you think about why should you watch esports and why should you care. So for, for, these particular, uh, for these particular pieces, we flew out to the houses of the, the players, a full production crew, uh, interviewed them, learned about their stories and what they're about, talked to their families about, hey, what was it like when he you know, wouldn't leave his room and played Rocket League every day for 10 hours and now he's making thousands of dollars playing the game. We, we capture that and we, we create it. But it takes an entire team dedicated traveling to build these types of, these types of stories uh, and to build this narrative around Rocket League. Another really big piece is the live events. Again, I could do an entire presentation on any of these, especially the live events, but we did our last season two grand finals in Amsterdam. Um, we had 1,200 people attend. We sold, we sold out tickets, I think, in two weeks, maybe a little bit less than that. Um, but there are a million moving parts to a live event, from stage design to hospitality to hotel booking to transportation to um, visas are a huge topic now in esports. How do you get um, players from other countries into the US to play uh, when it isn't recognized as an official sport by many, by many organizations? 
right? These are all huge hurdles that you have to overcome that are important when coordinating a live event of this size. The investment for these can scale anywhere from you know, $50,000 to millions and millions of dollars. Um, but the amount of work that goes into these things uh, is astounding, putting on a, a massive live event, uh, coordinating all these players. And, and I'll attest to the, the personal struggles I've had of coordinating 50, you know, 16 to 18 year old players uh, internationally, moving them over to Amsterdam can be very, very challenging. Uh, and then regional expansion, um, and really I, how I should phrase this is go to where the players are. Um, Oceania is where we've expanded the Rocket League Championship Series in season three, um, because that's where there is a passionate fan base of players, a, a big group of players as well, um, that demand, they're just really, really demanding uh, professional competition around Rocket League in their region. Um, and every time you expand, you run into the challenges of, um, can my rule set be legally uh, enforced in this region? How do I, how do, I do uh, international play with these regions? How do you build a league uh, that is culturally relevant to the, the player base uh, that's unique to this region too? So there are all of these things pop up and become extremely challenging as you think about regional expansion. And you can expect, uh, you know, in our partnership with Psyonix around Rocket League, uh, we'll continue to expand and we'll continue to have teams fully dedicated to thinking about like, how do we go into Brazil? How do we go into all these other regions that have all these unique challenges? And then lastly, I, I think the, the uh, one, one more major piece is, um, for us anyway, is, is event placement or slash TO support. How do we crowdsource competitive play? How do we get more people involved in running tournaments and playing in tournaments and again, creating a competitive culture around the game is super, super important. Now, I can't tell you where we're, we're gonna announce some stuff pretty soon, but a big part of our work is, hey, tournament organizer, what do you think about Rocket League? What is interesting to you? What do sponsors think? Like all of these different things and advocating to have this at all of these major esports events. Get it there, get more eyeballs on it is a really important point. Um, again, just driving engagement is really important. So I've, I've talked about like five or six things. I, I'm just scratching the surface as to the amount of work uh, and the amount of things that are moving when you create a holistic esports ecosystem. I haven't even hit on all of the content that's created around this. I haven't hit on the web development needs that need to happen, hospitality and travel. There are a bunch of moving pieces with fully dedicated staff to resolving, uh, you know, to addressing all of these different pieces of esports. So again, it's all in an effort to support a holistic system. It would be much easier for us to do, you know, two or three major events a year uh, and really throw all of our resources into that and then forget about all these other pieces. But in doing that, we wouldn't have the results that we do. And so this is uh, just from, we, I pulled this from an infographic that we have uh, around the season two world uh, championship for the Rocket League Championship Series. Um, 24.2 million minutes watched over a million unique viewers, uh, 1,200 live attendance, 3.9 million uh, Twitter impressions. These are all, this is a result of this holistic uh, approach to esports and a really important piece too. Without all of these things, we do not believe we would be where we are today. Um, and we see these numbers continuing, excuse me, continuing to grow over time. And as we continue to expand to different regions, um, as we continue to expand our efforts and the prestige of the RLCS continues to grow, we imagine these numbers are continue to go up. Um, you can find this actually, the infographic from season two on our RLCS Twitter account. Um, and again, like we're seeing even larger numbers for season three as we venture into that too. Um, so that's, again, that, that's a super high level. I've, I've, I can't believe I've already been talking for 20 minutes. Um, there are a bunch of moving parts. And really, again, I, my takeaway for you is you guys are seeing probably a, a broadcast or production on Twitch, um, but below the surface of that, you know, when we're talking about ESL events, when we're talking about all these different <laughs> tournament organizers, there are insanely huge staff supporting these massive events, um, in many cases much larger than what we have dedicated to the RLCS. Um, and if you take shortcuts in esports, you will find yourself as a game company in the esports graveyard. Uh, you need to be thinking about a holistic approach that touches all of these pieces plus more. 
Um, and so after this presentation, uh, after Chris speaks uh, at 11, I'll be out in the hall. I would love to talk to you guys and talk more. Uh, if you have questions about this, I'm gonna I'll open the mic here in a second too. Um, but again, just thinking about it's much, much bigger, much bigger than what you're seeing on Twitch. Uh, and in order to be successful, uh, you need to have a lot of resources dedicated to supporting this effort. All right, so thank you very much. I want to open it for questions. Hi there. Hey. Okay. Here's one. So uh, when you are trying to organize uh, an event, you're obviously organizing many of your own regional events leading up to the major. Mm -hmm. At what point do you decide to partner with existing events, eSport events like DreamHack or PAX or whatnot, uh, versus go and create your own uh, event that's dedicated to the one game? Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, in our case, what we generally do is we RFP. We'll request proposals uh, from people in the ecosystem, like, hey, we're thinking about doing this event. How would you do it and what's your take, right? And so then we weigh those proposals against like, what, what is it gonna take and what is it gonna cost to do it in-house, right? What are the, what's the, the comparison that we make? Is it worth it for us to do it? Do we expect a better fan experience, higher viewership? What's the marketing, marketing pool from these organizations? So we're weighing all of this value before we would move forward with something like that. But generally, it's a, it's a big question. Like, do you wanna continue to grow the ecosystem potentially or grow other tournament organizers? Um, at the cost of maybe them not investing as much as you would do it in-house. So there's all these trades that you're making by either doing it in-house or externally, and you have to figure out what's right for you based on, again, this value proposition that's in front of you. Okay, and as a, a corollary. Yeah, sure. Uh, what, as an event organizer myself, mm -hmm. what is it that I could do to get more companies and more eSport tournaments to happen at my event? That's a good question. Um, so, Generally, when we think about who we're gonna partner with uh, for, as a tournament organizer, we look at their track record. Um, we look at what have they done, um, and have they been able to, how have they done with the resources that they have? And if they've shown that they've been able to do a lot uh, with you know, potentially, in, in some cases, limited resources, um, is our contribution gonna bring them to a new level? Is it gonna help them be more successful? Or do we think that they can be, uh, they have the opportunity or they have the, um, they have the capacity to actually sort of level themselves up to a point where we think it's, it's worth supporting them. So my recommendation for you would be to run events and prove yourself, and I'm not sure how many you've done, um, and try to do something small uh, that is indicative of your capability, and from there start requesting more support from the game company or other tournament organizers to help support your event uh, based on your track record of success. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hello. So, um, <clears throat> I'm a member of the um, competitive fighting games community, Sweet. and one thing I've noticed is that there's actually been a pushback towards the concept of esports to the point mm. where it's almost seen with like a negative connotation, <laughs> yeah. because they see it as corporate kind of messing with grassroots events, mm -hmm. enforcing rule changes, trying to clean up the community to make it look better yeah. towards advertisers and sponsors. Oh. So. Um, what do you think is the best approach for a company that's kind of dealing with a community that doesn't necessarily want them to be involved? Yeah, really good question. Um, I've actually experienced this. So I used to work for a company called the IGN Pro League uh, a few years back, and we actually tried to esportsify the FGC uh, for a while. We, uh, we did a show with Mike Ross and some other things, and it, it was not received very well, and so we learned a valuable lesson there. Um, more than anything, I think sponsors and organizations want to be authentic to the space. Um, and so what is authenticity to the FGC? If I'm a sponsor and I want to come in and support your event, I don't want to do it in a way that makes me look foolish. Um, and so I actually want to be real uh, and be able to relate with the community. Uh, so the FGC, it's tough because as you bring in sponsors, sponsors innately are sort of like esports, I guess. So I, the fact that there's money is sort of esports uh, as it relates to the FGC. Um, but really just showing like what is interesting and unique about the FGC and why it's valuable for sponsors to get involved. How, how are they authentic and how can they activate in a way that is interesting and compelling to FGC fans? And if you can solve for that, uh, I think you can maintain the identity of, of, of the FGC while also sort of injecting more you know, sustainability and money into the ecosystem as a whole. Um, but yeah, I, I think the FGC wouldn't be what it is if you sort of like esportsify it. So you have to continue to sort of you know keep that identity true, 
Um, and I think the sponsors are going to want that, and the organizations are going to want that too. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Nick. Hey. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts, given you talked a little bit about international stuff, how the current anti-immigration climate yeah. really affects things and the corollary, what outfits like Twitch, other esports organizers, game developers can do to address that? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and something that we struggle with. It is a systematic problem. Um, so there are all sorts of challenges when an organization just being frank, with Twitch that's owned by Amazon starts to lobby in sort of like government dealings. Um, it becomes pretty challenging. There's a lot of, a lot of different steps. Um, but I think we can be a testament to um, the credibility and um, opportunity in the esports space because, I mean, we look at some of these esports athletes, rumors of salaries over $500,000 a year in, in a game like League of Legends or CSGO, uh, it's obvious that there is some skill, there is some skill to this thing. It is a skill-based uh, competition. And it's about sort of representing that in a way to the government or to the right entities uh, to show like, hey, this is for real and you need to take it seriously. Um, and so I think it starts with people sort of like um, rallying together and figuring out a strategy to to communicate that in an effective way and partnering with the right entities within um, probably academia and uh, the government as well to properly represent this skill-based um, thing that is esports. Um, there's a million different ways that we can do that, but I think it's gonna take a bunch of different entities with credibility in the world uh, to sort of represent that, hey, this is, this is important and it's, um, we need to resolve this issue because um, it's, it's sort of being a blocker to continual growth in the esports space. I think we have quite time for like one or Hi. two more. Yeah. Could hey. you tell me what percentage of esports leagues slash events are managed by Twitch or with Twitch oh, versus sure. the rest of the uh, space? Yeah, sure. Um, so we partner with uh, Capcom for the Capcom Pro Tour, uh, and that's, so that's Street Fighter V. Um, and we also partner with Psyonix around Rocket League. Um, and so we, we have some other ones coming up as well, but generally we're pretty, um, we're pretty mindful to not sort of, um, we're very selective in who we partner with, but we also wanna be mindful of the other players in the space and not come in and, and sort of like uh, take over uh, like these types of partnerships. There's a lot of great uh, smart organizations like ESL, DreamHack, in the space that are also great to, to support your esports efforts too. So we have two right now, and, and we have a few more that you can expect to hear about in the next few months. Um, but really, we're just trying to be mindful of like giving a little bit of a nudge in the right direction while also allowing the other really important players in the space to also enter into these partnerships and help point people in the right direction. All right, last one. Uh, how are you guys expanding your fan base? Um, to different cultures and subcultures where they might not actually accept an e-sport as a valid sport? Yeah, good question. Um, it's really hard. I think uh, people have a general um, like belief system as to what, like there's a general stigma around video games. I think we can all, everyone in the room can relate to that a little bit and, and it's growing or it's shrinking every day. Um, but generally our strategy is sort of, um, is working and trying to identify with the, the core fan base, uh, less of the people that are sort of like on the periphery um, that don't fully engage or believe in esports as sort of like a competitive aspect or something that's skill based. Um, but with that in mind, I think as esports grows, as more and more stories about uh, these players making millions of dollars from either streaming or playing competitively start to surface, I think that will lend credibility to the fact that esports is uh, interesting, compelling, uh, and something that you should pay attention to. So I think um, as this industry continues to grow, naturally people will be drawn to it um, as uh, viewing behaviors around content in general are gonna be changing, right? As there's more cord cutters and people are moving into sort of like on-demand type viewing experience that's more um, in line with like a Twitch uh, viewing experience. Um, and as that shift happens, and again, as esports continues to build its credibility over time, I think more people will be uh, drawn to it and accepting of it uh, in a way that 
many people in this room and myself are actively now. Cool, thanks very much guys. I'm gonna hand it over to Chris, appreciate it. Yes, I'm getting set up here. As Nick mentioned, uh, I'm Chris Wynn. I'm the executive producer on H1Z1 King of the Kill. Um, you're going to hear a lot of very similar themes and takeaways as you did in Nick's presentation. It's almost like we coordinated, uh, but I promise you we just met this morning. So I think maybe we're onto something here. Ultimately, to kind of talk about how we've been successful in eSports, it's a pretty complicated recipe. Um, there's a lot of pieces that actually go into it. If I try to take away the biggest ingredient, you know, if this were chicken parmesan, chicken would be the biggest ingredient. Um, and it's that we've taken the approach that we're gonna partner very, very closely with our community. Uh, we didn't come out and say, here's the next big competitive game, here's the next eSport that you wanna pay attention to. We put out a game that we thought was fun and then we listened to the community kind of guide us to say, hey, we'd love to compete, here's what we'd like to see in the game. And then we worked with that in our roadmap um, and started to deliver a feature set to let them decide what was gonna work and what wasn't going to work. If you're not familiar with H1Z1, uh, just real quickly, it's kind of a really new, unique game. Uh, it's a bit of an evolution of a shooter. 175 people parachute into a big open world environment. Uh, when you hit the ground, you gotta kind of scavenge around the world to look for weapons and equipment. Uh, that's gonna help you compete against all the other players in the world. There's no respawns, it's all single elimination, so everything's on the line for you as you uh, play the game. What it does is build so much tension that when you win the game, it feels like you're on top of the world. Um, I've been working on this game for over a year. I have hundreds and hundreds of hours of gameplay. I have yet to win a game. Um, it drives me absolutely nuts. I've come close a few times, and I tell you, it's, it, uh, every, every time I'm in the top 10, I'm like, this is gonna be it, this is gonna be it, and then I fucking come in second or third. <laughs> <and I> just, <laughs> uh, so far, we've, uh, we've taken a, a walk, not a run approach uh, to what we're doing in the competitive community. Um, so in 2015, we launched our first Invitational. We did this at TwitchCon, um, and what we did was invite 60 of our, of our biggest streamers from Twitch. Uh, to compete for over $170,000 in prize money. Um, we raised that prize money with the community, um, and so we took a portion of proceeds that we sold from some in-game items and used that to form a prize pool. Um, ended up being very, very successful. It was the most watched program at TwitchCon that year. Um, it really kind of catapulted and, and uh, sent H1Z1 off on, on a big trajectory that we're still following today. Uh, we followed that up in 2016 at TwitchCon again, we opened the, pri the, uh, the, the field up a little bit. We had uh, 70 people involved. Prize pool got much bigger, over $250,000 this last year. Um, again, big impression, a lot of people watching it. I think we had over 1,000 hours of uh, gameplay stream leaning up to the event. Um, really exciting couple of matches and uh, really kind of led to a lot of, uh, a lot of success for us. Um, what we've seen this year is uh, really kind of beginning with, uh, with, eight, with the 2016 Invitational, we've started to see pro teams start to form around the event. Um, and when I put this slide together about a week ago, maybe a little over a week ago, we had uh, I think six or seven pro teams announced. Um, they had announced, officially announced rosters to compete in H1Z1, and I think even since then we've had another three or four. Um, as recently as yesterday, I saw a couple of announcements from some teams. Um, that's leading up to our next event, which is called Fight for the Crown. What's cool about this, it'll take place in uh, March. It's going to air on the CW network in April um, in prime time, which is something we're really excited about. It's also going to be our first tournament uh, using one of our team modes. So this will be 15 teams of five, all competing to see who can be the last team standing. Um, what's gonna be really cool and what, what H1Z1 has that's really unique there is that we're the only game you can find where 15 teams can compete at the same time. Um, every other game is 1v1 one team versus another team, and we can get every single team in there competing at once. Um, a really unique cocktail and a really unique mixture to see how that's gonna play out. So it's worked for us. Uh, we did really, really well in 2016. We were uh, high up on the Steam charts. Um, you can routinely find us in the top five stream games on Twitch right now. We're almost always in the top five. Um, in the last two weeks, we've been the number one selling title on Steam on their global top sellers list. Um, the success has blown us away. Uh, quite frankly, we're kind of sprinting to keep up uh, to make sure all of our services stand, uh, keep standing up and provide the best service as we can. 
So what about the game is kind of leading to that success from our opinion, it, it breaks down to these kind of simple concepts. So to start off with, the core of the game is actually very simple. You drop into an environment, you have to live. Don't die, right? That's pretty much it. Uh, but from there, there's actually a lot of depth layered into it. There's a ton of strategies that you need to employ when you hit the ground. Where do you land? How many other people land near you? Uh, what loot is around you? It's all randomly generated on the ground. So you can go in with a plan A, but you better be ready to go all the way to plan Z uh, based on how the match plays out. Um, there's also a gas, a poisonous gas ring that slowly shrinks the map uh, to, to shrink the play space. It's a 100 square kilometer open world environment. Um, and so to, that's pretty important to keep the, uh, to keep the players together and competing. Uh, when we talk about competitive gaming, so I completely agree with Nick, please don't spell eSports with a capital S. Um, and in fact, we talk a lot about competitive gaming because for us it's more than just the eSports, it's more than the spectacle of watching it, it's more than putting on the tournaments. Um, all, the heart of our game is competitive and we want that to be open to every single player that participates in our game, not just the pros who are getting identified and picked up by teams. Uh, we really talk a lot about as we're building the game that we need to make sure it's fun to watch. Um, no one's going to watch it if it's not fun to watch, and so we want to make sure that we keep the spectacle of watching the action as fun as possible. It's more than just playing the game. It's also how people are viewing it. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, partnering with our community is a big part of what we do. Um, it can be frustrating at times because you get a lot of negative feedback, but you have to understand that comes with the job and that comes with the territory. Um, and you have to get to the root of what people are complaining about and get down to it and, and, and try to make a game that you know they're going to gravitate towards. So as mentioned on the simple concept, I've talked about this. You know, again, very, very unique. You're not going to find a game where 175 people compete all at once. It's a huge open world. I mentioned 100 square kilometers, and this shrinks over time. The course of one match takes about 35 minutes, start to finish. Most players are in there for a couple of minutes, and then they're, uh, they're going to filter out and go into the next game. But that depth is really crazy. Strategy is paramount. Um, there are key distinct strategies that are employed in the early game versus the mid game versus the late game, and it evolves very quickly. Well, the early game is all about finding loot as fast as you can and clearing out any players that may have landed around you. Mid game is about really setting yourself up for the late game, and late game is making sure you have enough equipment to survive. You probably want a vehicle to get around the map on and uh, set yourself up uh, for those final, those final 10 that I kind of talked about. Um, and you just have to be ready to adapt. All the loot that spawns in the world is random. It's going to be different every single match. Um, and I've talked about the moving gas. There's an element of crafting in our game. So you're going to pick up items and you're going to craft uh, medical supplies and other things to kind of help you during the match, armor, stuff like that. Um, and so understanding that depth of the game and what you need to find in order to craft is, becomes a pretty big part of the skill mastery. Uh, vehicles are a big part of the game. If you are at the end of the game and you don't have a vehicle, you're going to be at a distinct disadvantage right now. Um, and so. Again, more skill to learn there, more to master to learn where the vehicles are spawning at and, uh, and then finding one and understanding how to take care of it. Um, it uses gas, it has health. You have to make sure you, you manage that, which layers into there's an RPG element of inventory management. And so you can only carry so much stuff and you have to decide, am I gonna carry this extra weapon or do I need more med packs in case I get into a, get into a fight? Do I want smoke grenades or do I want frag grenades? Um, all this is to say, you have to stay on your toes, and there's a deceptive amount of depth to this game. Um, it seems very simple, it's a, it can be very easy to describe, but to get really good at it, it takes a long time. We talk about this at the office a lot. You know, when we build our competitive game, we want anyone to be able to have a chance to succeed and do well. Um, and so we talk about the average Joe becoming a pro. Um, and so when we look at how we start to open up our competitive events, can we add a qualifying path that any person in our community has access to and we're not just picking uh, you know, the 50 best players in the world or something like that. Um, and so we've built in leaderboards. We've worked with a uh, website, Twin Galaxies. They, have, uh, they partner with the team Echo Fox where they have also a set of leaderboards and we can use these things to determine where the skill is and you don't necessarily have to be you know, a big personality on Twitch in order to get discovered. You can come at it from your skill set and, and, and be found and be invited to an event to compete. Uh, we have a whole meta on top of the game where every single match you play in gets scored. Um, and one thing that was really important to us there is that scoring system is, is non-punitive. So your top 10 scores from all your matches determine your place on a leaderboard and then you can work up different divisions and tiers through the leaderboard, but you're never gonna go backwards. Um, we always want players to feel like they're progressing and that they have something to attain and work towards. 
And then, like I said, in the depth, it's, it's getting players to focus on their own skill set and not blame things on the game. You know, there's more to learn. There's more to watch on Twitch. I can go watch, uh, you know, a good player and kind of see how they approach the strategy and, and get some tips to my own game so I can continue to refine my own experience. Uh, and then it's really about sharing that experience. Um, we've done a pretty big in-game uh, integration with Twitch with their API. Uh, so if you would like to try to get discovered, we sort based on maybe the number of wins you have or the number of kills you have, uh, where you're at in the match. So someone might be interested to find the next really talented person as opposed to the next big personality. Um, again, it's trying to put an avenue for everybody. The big personalities are going to get recognized, they're going to get picked up by viewers anyway. But how can skilled players get found as well? Um, and this is something that we're going to continue to work on in the future to have a, you know, a tighter and tighter integration with Twitch. Keeping it fun to watch. Uh, we talk a lot, the phrase we use is the game needs to be as fun to watch as it is to play. It starts with that very simple to understand game. It's a solo experience, there's no respawns. I can watch someone play, I know exactly what's going on and I don't have to worry about they're gonna die, they're gonna respawn at some other place in the map and I need to understand the map so that I can keep track of their progress and where they're kind of, what strategy they're employing at that particular time. As I'm watching someone play, it's really easy to kind of go, oh, you know what, if I was in that position, I would do this or I would do that. Um, and that kind of opens up your mind into, into thinking, oh, you know, maybe I'd like to try this game. I think I can do better than that person I was just watching. The game naturally is set up with a good pace that, that lends itself pretty well to our, to our streamers. They have time in between matches, whether, whether loading, and loading, loading out and loading in and getting ready for a new match. They even have time during games sometimes to interact with their viewers. So it makes it easy for them to call out subs, to call out tips, to interact and chat. Um, and that's pretty important to them, and it's pretty important to the viewers watching the experience. And it's something our game lends very well to. Uh, I talked about the in-game Twitch integration and, and wanting to push that even further. And we spent a lot of time building those relationships with our community. Uh, we tried to fly them out to the studio every so often, talk about our roadmap, get their feedback, show the latest progress on the game. Um, I talk to, I get texted every day from multiple members of our community. Um, sometimes not fun, Texas, but... <laughs> We deal with them all the same. And to kind of finish up on that secret sort of part of the recipe, our community and the competition is what drives the game. Uh, we have a new feature rolling out in a few weeks that we're calling Hosted Games. Um, what this is allows is some grassroots um, participation in the competitive space. So we've done some stuff in the past, um, a little bit more manual, and this is a system to allow, to start to allow it a little bit uh, in a larger scale. Uh, where we did some things around Champions Arena where they bring in, they invite the best players from the community where they compete every single week and, uh, and have a lot of fun to see who's the best. Uh, we do things with, with uh, Chicken Dinner Show, which is a show run by a few people on Twitch, um, where they also do some competitions and some fun stuff. Um, and we've had a lot of international uh, support that we're trying to open up as well. We've already run events in North America and Europe and Japan in terms of our, our community grassroots stuff, and we want to open that up even further um, as we support more and more of uh, the globe. The Invitationals are a big part of, of uh, it's kind of the heart of our competition right now, as we did in, in 2015, 2016. We're going to do it again in 2017. Uh, the first year was really just kind of, what can we do here? And then we were able to open it up last year by, by expanding a little bit more internationally. We brought some players in from Brazil. We brought players in from Europe. Uh, we had a player qualify on site from Korea. Um, and so that's something that we want to, uh, to continue in the future and even grow even more. Uh, the Fight for the Crown, the next big event that we have going on will be our expansion into team games, team tournaments. Um, we think with this and a few other features we have rolling out in the next month, um, we're going to see our popularity of our five, particular our five-man, but also our two-man mode just uh, grow exponentially. Um, we think that's really going to take off when we unlock some, some potential there. Um, and then the way we interact with our community is really important to us. Um, I personally run regular Reddit AMAs. I try to do it every other week. Um, I try to respond as much as I can on Twitch or on, on Twitter. Um, I regularly watch our streamers play the game because I'm looking to see how they're, what they're doing, what's sort of the new trends coming up in the game, things I need to be aware of, things that maybe we need to fix. Um, but also just interact with them to find out what's frustrating you, what are you liking, how's it going, uh, what do we need to put some focus on. Um, and I also, again, personally, I write a, uh, I try to do it every month where I write a producer letter to the community. Here's our current focus, here's what we're hearing, here's what we're trying to get fixed up for you guys. Um, it's that just regular constant contact. Um, and it kind of, like I said, it's sort of uh, get ready to kind of get the good and the bad with that. So what got us here 
um, is going to continue to guide us into the future. Uh, as we look to expand the number of events we run, so expand outside of TwitchCon and start to partner with places like DreamHack and some other things to run even more events, um, and we want to expand even more globally. We have a tremendous growth curve in Asia right now. Um, so how can we tap into that? We're already very, very popular in Europe. How can we do more in Europe? Um, and, and just continue to grow the game with the focus being on the competitive aspect of it. So I should have some time for some questions. Uh, I'll quite possibly give some answers. So I have a question regarding the prime time showing in the CW. Seeing how like you have different um, game lengths for each match, how do you guys control it so like every big game that's uh, streamed fits within the time requirements of like you know prime time? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, how do we handle a TV broadcast when the when the game length can be varying? Um, it's pre-recorded, so <laughs> we will record the the gameplay in the tournament in uh, mid March, and then we get a month to edit it and and uh, we can fill in with content as we need to to fill in our broadcast. All right, thank you. Hi there. Yeah, what's up? <clears throat> I, was, um, I was wondering, when you look at the community and you hear their feedback uh, to find out what they like and what they enjoy about your game, uh, how did you collect the data? Did you get it through Reddit? Did you get it uh, specifically through them writing to you? Did you, the Reddit, the Reddit MMA, MMAs or? Yeah, so we're, how do we collect the feedback? It, it essentially comes from everywhere, so. Um, it's not just the AMAs, it's also what people are posting in Reddit every single day. I try to go on there every night and just kind of get apprised of what's going on. Um, I see what people are posting to me to Twitter. We talk to our customer service department to see what people are reporting. One-on-one um, -on -one individual contact with uh, some of the players in the community, um, as well as we occasionally put out player surveys to collect uh, more empirical data to try to guide some decisions that we're making. Uh, but ultimately, it's a collection of all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then as we look for trends and different themes of areas where we want to go put some focus on the game, we try to try to collate it all into one big chunk of feedback to go, okay, this is what we're going to do. I think that's awesome. Keep it up. How's it going? Good. Um, congrats on bringing the game to the CW. That's really exciting. Can you share more about that courting process or what, what it is that attracted them to you and you to them? Uh, yeah, so how did, how did kind of the CW come about? Um, you know, quite honestly, it's a little bit of fortune, a little bit of luck, a little bit of hard work. Um, we have a, a, a pretty close partnership with uh, Rick Fox, who owns Team Echo Fox. Um, and his team was the first to get involved with H1Z1. Um, and so as he has had lots of contacts with his other teams around League of Legends and CSGO and the other teams that he runs, um, the opportunity kind of grew a little bit from, uh, from Echo Fox and CW. Um, and then we got involved as, uh, as part of that, and it just uh, it all worked out. It was a great partnership for all three of us. So. Awesome. Congrats. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. Uh, so you talked a lot about listening to your community about what their, their needs and their wants were, but how deliberate were you in the beginning in shaping that community, if at all, and making sure that it was accessible and comfortable for all kinds of players? Well, that's a good question. So how do we go about shaping the community? Um, you know, ultimately, I'd say it started very almost grassroots-ish. Uh, lots of people in the, on the dev team just reaching out to different, different people in the community and starting to build relationships with them and starting to talk to them on a regular basis. Um, in a lot of cases, there's a lot of pretty close friendships uh, that, have, that have developed over the last two years. Um, I think it's also been, I've been at, uh, I've been on H1Z1 for a little over a year now. I think this is also a little bit of Daybreak's DNA. Um, having formerly been Sony Online Entertainment with EverQuest and uh, some of the other games they built, being close to their community was always part of what they did. Um, and so sort of naturally fit into H1Z1 as we uh, began to develop that game and, and thought about where it could go. Um, so it was really, I think it was probably a little bit less intentional than maybe the answer you were, you were originally thinking, but uh, definitely just part of the natural thinking of the studio and natural culture of the studio. Thank you. Uh, so you chose to run invitational style events based on kind of popularity of content creators versus say meritocracy, people that won a lot. Um, and I'm just curious in those events, how were you able to leverage kind of the personalities of the players uh, in, in an event that they weren't kind of streaming themselves? 
Yeah, so how did we leverage the personalities of the streamers kind of to our benefit in the Invitational? Um, we did it a lot in kind of the lead up to it. Um, so we did a lot of promotional content, a lot of marketing content that would focus on some of the streamers. We did some uh, pretty big things on the streamers that won the year before or the, or the winners from the year before. And the way we generate the prize pool is with an in-game crate that uh, has vanity items for players. A lot of those, most of the items in that crate are based on the personalities playing in the tournament. Um, so like Ninja is one of our big streamers. Uh, there was a Ninja shirt the first year. There was a Ninja a gun skin uh, the second year. So we kind of partner with them to, uh, to put them into the crate and promote them a bit. All right, perfect. Uh, thanks a lot, you guys, for attending. Uh, they asked me to remind you to please fill out the evaluations as, uh, as you leave. And I uh, hope you enjoy GDC. Thanks. <laughs>